Pray Like a Millionaire, written and read by Marcia Miles Ramsey. Copyright 2020. Chapter 6. Prayers for Provision. When teaching the disciples how to pray, Jesus told this parable. Which of you shall have a friend, and shall go unto him at midnight, and say unto him, Friend, lend me three loaves, for a friend of mine in his journey is come to me, and I have nothing to set before him? And he from within shall answer and say, Trouble me not, the door is now shut, and my children are with me in bed. I cannot rise and give thee. I say unto you, though he will not rise and give him, because he is his friend, yet because of his importunity he will rise and give him as many as he needeth. Luke eleven five through eight, importunity is defined as persistence, especially to the point of annoyance. In the story, Jesus describes circumstances involving a friend of a friend. One friend has already secured his dwelling for the night. His children are safely tucked into bed in the same chamber as he and their mother. This was a custom during that time period, due to the limited space and rooms inside of a dwelling. One historian describes it as the divan or platform at the end or sides of a room often served as bedstead. In such a room, the master of the house and his family lay, according to the parable in Luke eleven seven. Anyone with children will understand how inconvenient it would be to have someone show up at such a time of night. No one wants to risk waking their sleeping children, especially if there's a baby in the house, and in this case, the impression we are given is that the exterior door opens not only into the house, but into the very chamber where they're all sleeping. Unlatching and opening that door would very likely awaken the entire family. Yet Jesus says that because of the insistence of the friend, the other one rises and provides for his need. Gill's exposition of this verse says the design of this parable is the same with that of the widow and the unjust judge. In Luke 18, 1, which is to show the force of importunity, where friendship, as here, and the fear of God and regard of men, which were lacking there, have no influence, and so to encourage constancy and perseverance in prayer with earnestness, taking no denial at the hand of God, but still continuing to make pressing instances. It was not friendship that motivated the master of the house to get up and give bread to the friend. The friend had disregarded common courtesy, abandoned manners by knocking on someone's door at such a late hour. Many of us know what it feels like to have a friend who takes advantage of the friendship, perhaps waiting until a late hour to call or imposing on us by asking probing questions. Jesus' point is that if someone who is feeling put out, annoyed, and inconvenienced in such a manner as the master of the house in this parable is willing to get up and give the petitioner what is needed— just to get rid of them, then in contrast, how much more will a loving, compassionate Heavenly Father give to those who ask of Him? Following the parable, Jesus gives the disciples an imperative. He says, And I say unto you, Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For every one that asks receives, and he that seeks finds, and to him that knocks it shall be opened. When we pray, we are in effect asking, seeking, and knocking. Bible scholars agree that these three verbs, ask, seek, and knock, as used in Luke eleven nine, are almost identical to those used in Matthew 7, 7, and that they are in the present active imperative tense, meaning make it a habit to ask, seek, knock. Ask and keep on asking. Seek and keep on seeking. Knock and keep on knocking, as in, don't stop. Most of the sermons that I've heard preached from these texts emphasize that our prayers are answered because of our persistence. But Heinrich August Wilhelm Meyer, a German Protestant Bible scholar who lived from 1800 to 1873, says that the original Greek word used in this passage points not, as it is usually understood, to perseverance in prayer, but to the certainty of prayer being heard. Meyer's position is that Jesus focuses on the action of our Heavenly Father hearing our prayers. This is something that Jesus himself made reference to when he prayed at the tomb of Lazarus. He began his prayer with, Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me. 
and I know that thou hearest me always. As we consider this lesson on prayer that comes directly from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, let us note the blessed assurance he gives us in verses 11 to 13. Jesus says to the disciples, If a son shall ask bread of any of you that is a father, will he give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, will he for a fish give him a serpent? Or if he shall ask an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? What powerful questions! The answer is understood to be a resounding no. When we bring our request to God, He not only hears us, He knows the intent of our heart, and His answer will be in relation to our petition. God will never answer our prayer by giving us a sorry substitute. Notice that a stone may resemble an unsliced loaf of bread, and the skin of a serpent may resemble the scales of a fish. And historians note that during the time in which Jesus spoke these words, there was a type of white scorpion that tucked its tail in a manner that caused it to resemble the shape of an egg, and that those listening would have been familiar with his reference. Therefore, Jesus didn't randomly choose these contrasting things. He was letting us know that our Heavenly Father doesn't trick us by giving us something that appears to be the answer and then turns out to leave us worse off than before. God is not cruel. He does not deceive us. But Jesus warns us to try the Spirit to be sure that it is of God. When we think we have our answer, we need to ask God to confirm it to us. Why is that? If we ask God for an answer and an answer comes, why would we question it? The reason is very straightforward. Satan. Satan comes to steal, kill, and destroy. That's his mission and his aim. One of the ways he achieves his purpose is by tricking or deceiving us. When we pray, we direct our prayers to our Heavenly Father, but Satan is an eavesdropper. He makes it his business to listen in on our lives for the very purpose of trying to intercept, hinder, or falsify the answers to our prayers. This is why we must try the Spirit or put it to the test. Let me give you an example. One night, the disciples were out on the water in a boat. The scripture tells us, that Jesus was coming towards them walking on the water. The disciples thought they were seeing a ghost, but Peter recognized something about the form that was drawing closer to them, and he called out, Lord, if it be you, bid me to come to you. Jesus said, Come. And as you may recall, Peter stepped out of the boat and began to also walk on water. This is such an amazing account of the miraculous nature and power of God. Suppose that the disciples were right, and it wasn't really Jesus at all, but rather they were seeing things that weren't really there. Maybe some type of mirage or figment of their imaginations. Where would Peter have been to step out of the boat? He would have drowned. How do I know? Because we know that even with Jesus being there, Peter got nervous as he realized that he was doing the impossible, and he began to sink. He had to call out to Jesus to save him. If Peter had known how to swim, it stands to reason, he would have merely turned and swam back to the boat. Thankfully, Peter was wise, and he tried the Spirit before stepping out. In other words, when we think we know the answer to a prayer, we need to test it out and see if it lines up with God's Word. God will never tell us to do something that violates His commandments or is in contradiction to His holy nature. Here's another example. In late January of 2020, a man named Randall Hartman had stopped at a storage unit located in Marion County, South Carolina. While there, he placed an envelope containing $800 in cash on the hood of his truck. Suddenly, a burst of wind blew the cash into the air. A woman named Jacqueline, who was driving close by, saw the cash blowing in the wind. She stopped her vehicle and started grabbing it up. First a $100 bill, then another, then several 20s. After she gathered up over $200, she jumped back into her car and drove away with it. Unbeknownst to Jacqueline, all of this was captured on surveillance video. The police sent out a video alert asking the public to help them locate the woman. It didn't take long for them to track her down. When confronted about her theft, Miss Lowry stated that she didn't feel she had done anything wrong. She said, It was blowing in the wind. I was like, God, you know, God's blessed me. You know, I needed the money. Can you see how this single mother of three might tell herself that finding cash blowing in the wind was an answer to her prayer for money? 
Some of you will think it ridiculous of her to think such a thing, while others of you might feel sorry for her and think it was a reasonable conclusion. We could argue whether or not this was technically stealing versus merely having the good fortune of finding money, but if we are objective and honest, we must conclude that at the very least, Ms. Lowry should have shown some diligence in trying to find the owner of the money before claiming it as her own. The point is that God will never violate His own commandments as a means of answering our prayers. He has unlimited ways to meet our needs, and all of them are true and honest and moral and ethical and holy. For example, in Matthew seventeen twenty-seven, Jesus instructed Peter to go fishing and to open the mouth of the first fish he caught, and that he would find a four drachma coin and to then use it to pay their taxes. This is a true and fascinating story of God's provision, and it did not violate any of his commands. When you pray, you should pray with the expectation of God sending the answer, but be careful when the answer seems to come. Put it to the test and make sure it aligns with God's known word. If a woman is praying for a good man to come into her life, rest assured God is not going to send her someone else's husband. Jesus said, God's answers do not leave us in worse condition than before. He knows how to give good, honest, righteous, holy, true gifts to his children. I would be remiss to leave this teaching on prayer without drawing attention to the way in which Jesus concludes verse 13. He says, If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? Note that the one answer to every prayer we could pray is the Holy Spirit. What an answer. In the Holy Spirit we find comfort. We find the mind of Christ. We find help in time of trouble. We find peace in the midst of storms. We find discernment of right and wrong. We find a well of water springing up into everlasting life. If only we could grasp the abundance that comes when we are filled with the Holy Spirit, I believe our prayers would be completely transformed. Jesus shifts from referencing specific needs that a son might ask from his earthly father, such as bread, fish, or an egg, all of which relate to provision for strengthening the body, to the specific gift of the Holy Spirit, whom God the Father gives to us to strengthen, teach, and empower us. Bengal Noman says regarding the gift of the Holy Spirit, He is moreover more necessary to the soul than food is to the body. The Holy Spirit is particularly needful when it comes to praying. Romans eight twenty six and 27 says, The Spirit also helps our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit itself makes intercession for us with groaning which cannot be uttered. And he who searches our hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. In Jesus teaching his disciples to pray, he specifically states that God will give the Holy Spirit to those who ask. In receiving the Holy Spirit, We learn how to pray according to God's will because the Holy Spirit prays for us and He knows what is the will of God. Is Jesus saying that we should not pray about these needs? No, but what He is saying is that we should not be anxious, fearful, or worried about them, nor should we be so consumed with accumulating them that we become overtaken by the pursuit of them. This is very important for us to remember because the Gospel of Mark warns us that the cares of life can choke out the Word of God and render it unfruitful in our lives. Please note that it isn't the Word that is unfruitful. It is the soil of a troubled, anxious, greedy heart that is the problem. God tells us in Isaiah 55, 11, So shall my word be that goes forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. The word that is sown is good word. It is the gospel. Yet it cannot produce fruit in us because the soul of a heart that is overcome with the cares and pursuits of life prevents it from taking root. For this reason, Jesus warns us not to be as the heathens who seek after all these things. Matthew 6.32 A heathen is someone who does not believe in or worship the true God. Jesus concludes his teaching in Matthew chapter 6 by giving this imperative, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you.
As we come to know God by spending time with Him, we begin to understand that He is our source and provision. We worry less about running out of the necessities because we are His children and He will take care of us in times of plenty or in times of famine. As we pursue His work, He provides the way. In the Old Testament book of Isaiah, we find this powerful verse, Thou meetest him that rejoiceth and worketh righteousness, those that remember thee in thy ways. Bible scholar McLaurin says regarding this verse, The first stage on the road, which will bring any man into and keep any man in contact with God and loving fellowship with him, is the contemplation of his character as it is made known to us by his acts. If we look closely at the parables and teachings Jesus gave concerning prayer, we find that they center around how our Heavenly Father acts in response to our need for provision and to our cries for help. He acts in a loving, compassionate, and merciful way because that is His character. Therefore, as we seek Him first, above asking for our needs or desires, we are putting priority where it belongs, on the goodness, grace, and generosity of a God who not only loves us, He is love. Prayer Father, thank you that you know what we have need of before we even ask. Thank you, Lord, that in compassion you didn't send away the people who had been listening to you as you preached, but you said to your disciples, we cannot send them away hungry lest they faint. You knew, God, that even though they had been receiving spiritual food, that still in the natural body they had needs for the physical body. Thank you, God that you have made every provision for us, not just spiritually, but physically as well. You know our needs in our financial areas. You know our needs emotionally. You know our needs for fellowship and relationship. And Father, when we come to you with these real, natural, physical needs, help us to be careful when we seem to have an answer. Help us to put that to the test to know that we have an enemy who tries to send counterfeits to intercept the true answer. Help us be willing to wait patiently for the right answer, the one that honors you and comes from you, because then that will be the true blessing that we long for. We thank you for your wisdom and your guidance and your grace. In Jesus' name, amen.